to talk a little bit about uh, the changing world of uh, college football and all the uh, uh, the things that are happening now in terms of both the, uh, the not only the broadcast and the technology of it, but the influence of college football and television together. Particularly interesting to me is what's happening with the uh, creation of networks by individual schools. Notre Dame had kind of a monopoly for a while. Now we see BYU and the University of Texas creating their own networks and the Pac-12 network is on its way. I'm wondering what your take is on the development of the relationship between college football and uh, television. Well, what word do you want to put on it? Uh, simply put, it's money. And secondly put, probably greed. Uh, ESPN is uh, in with Texas on the network they've fixed up. The uh, Big Ten Network, uh, and I'm doing 20 half hours of so-called icons for the Big Ten because they're old friends and a lot of guys that I've known for years. But uh, Fox bought in there and, and they're bankrolling uh, the Big Ten Network because they wanted to buy a piece of the action in that particular conference. And that was a way to do it. And lo and behold, the dang thing's making money. <laughs> so. Um, there's always a hook in there somewhere where the, somebody's chasing a buck, and uh, that's what's happened, uh, I guess, to the whole world. Didn't it? I, I wanted to touch on another subject completely, but you were uh, a key part of that since this event tonight is about the community's history. Back in 1958, you were part of something very, very special in Seattle sports history with the, uh, the crew team of the University of Washington against the, uh, a much more formidable, it appeared, Soviet Army team back in 1958. I wondered if you might be able to take viewers who are unfamiliar with that experience to exactly what that was. The, the fun part of the story is uh, it resulted from uh, as the result of a football slush fund that got the University of Washington put on probation. And the rowing stewards owned the shell house and the land out there and they were mad in hell about it. And so they went to their pockets and and their buddies' pockets, and they got enough money to send the crew, a good crew, over to Henley for the Royal Regatta. And they met the Soviets in the Grand Challenge match, the final one, and it was in a screaming thunderstorm, lightning bolts and everything flashing across the old Thames River. And uh, the Soviets beat them, Trude, out of Leningrad. And uh, two days later, a guy in a, in a blue suit showed up, with a briefcase and got a hold of L. Ulbrichson while they were packing up to come back to Seattle, their tails dragging and angry because they got whooped like that, and said, Coach, how would you like a, another shot at those guys? We just finished yesterday the first cultural exchange program with the Soviet Union, and we will send your crew, pay all the expenses, to Moscow for a rematch, if you're willing. And they were the first athletes to go in under that cultural exchange program. And when I heard that, I mean, I went to work. And George Myers and Royal Brougham of the two newspapers here, Harvard Ramey, my cameraman, and I, we went into the Soviet Union on a visa, just a plain old tourist visa. And to, uh, just to illuminate, uh, this was not done before that. Nobody had ever done that. No, not, nothing live. And Irving R. Levine was a great, great help. I'll tell you one quick story, and it, it's directly applicable to the city of Seattle. We went out, we finally got permission from the foreign ministry to do it, and from, we had no trouble with the television and radio people. We didn't have television, just radio. No television in those days. But we went out to the uh, reservoir, and this woman with a pistol on her hip and a rifle in her hand and a very stern attitude wouldn't let us in. Didn't know and, who you were. Yeah, and she wanted a piece of paper with a stamp on it. Well, Yuri Kolosov, who was a professor at Moscow University, would turn purple. He was screaming. He was angry. But he, she would not let you in, and neither would anybody else around this thing. So Howard Ramele reached into his wallet. He's pumping around here, and he comes out with a Seattle police and fire department press card with a notary stamp on it. We showed it to her. She opened the gate. <laughs> who knew that Seattle was so influential back in 1958? That's wonderful. And then uh, the outcome of the event. Huskies whooped them. Keith, this has been a real pleasure to have you here, and thank you for coming by and taking a few minutes here at Sports Press Northwest. We appreciate it. Continued success, and uh, we hope to uh, have you back for many years.